President Trump is expected to announce his pick to replace Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg this week. During a rally in the battleground state of North Carolina Saturday night, the president said his nominee will be a woman. CBS News has learned that the leading contenders are Federal Circuit Court Judges Amy Coney Barrett and Barbara Lagoa, as well as Deputy White House Counsel Kate Comerford Todd. Joining me now to discuss is John Malcolm. He's a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation and the vice president of its Institute for Constitutional Government and the director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. John, great to have you. We just highlighted three of the names said to be on the president's short list. Is there anything else that you think the president should consider? And what's your reaction to those three? Well, I, th I think the three of them are, are great. I've never met Judge uh, Lagoa, uh, but people I know who know her well think very, very highly of her. I, ha I have met uh, Kate Comer for Todd uh, and also Amy Coney Barrett. And I would not completely count out, by the way, uh, a fourth potential uh, contender who would be Judge Allison Rushing on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, they all seem, you know, very distinguished. Uh, uh, Kate Todd, uh, clerk for, I think it was for Michael Ludig and then, and then Clarence Thomas, Amy uh, uh, Barrett, clerk for uh, Lauren Silberman on the D.C. Circuit, and then for Antonine Scalia. Uh, judge Lagoa, while she's a brand new 11th Circuit judge, has actually been a judge since uh, 2006. They all have very distinguished uh, careers. Two of them, of course, Judge Barrett and Judge Lagoa, have gone through the confirmation process before Judge Lagoa did so very recently. And I expect that if they are uh, nominated and we proceed to a hearing, that they will hold up very well under what will no doubt be an unbelievably contentious confirmation hearing. Definitely. You also mentioned Alison Rushing. Uh, why don't you talk to our viewers a little bit about her? She's less familiar to all of us. Well, she's younger. Judge Rushing is, uh, is 38 years old. She's on the Fourth Circuit a court of appeals, uh, and you know she had a very distinguished career before she went there. Immediately before going there, she was um, a partner uh, at the law firm of Williams and Connolly. She was also a government lawyer for quite some time. Uh, people think very, very highly of her, uh, both in terms of her personality and clearly her legal acumen. Well, you put together a list in 2016 that then-candidate Trump said influenced the list that he released ahead of that election. Take us through the process for selecting and nominating judicial nominees. What are the president and Senate lawmakers looking for? Well, what I hope that they are looking for is somebody who not only has the requisite you know, academic background and, uh, and experience, but also somebody who is an originalist and a textualist, uh, somebody who will follow the law as written and, out, and how it was understood at the time the law was passed or a constitutional provision was ratified, and isn't going to sort of look at words in text or constitution and pour into them their own personal or political preferences. That is what I hope they look for. Uh, no doubt, you know, different presidents, depending on which uh, which party they belong to, uh, may view things the same way I do, or they may prefer to have a so-called living constitutionalist. And no doubt, uh, senators may feel the same way. Well, on that point about personal preferences and, uh, and, and perhaps personal ethics and religion, I want to talk to you a little bit more about Amy Coney Barrett. During her confirmation sure. process for the federal bench in 2017, she faced criticism over her views on abortion. How could this and her other writings on matters of faith potentially play into her confirmation process if she becomes the president's nominee? Well, I don't remember. I mean, she may have well expressed her personal views on abortion, but I don't believe that she has. She's written about Roe versus Wade as precedent, but I don't think she's ever in any of our, her academic writing uh, called for Roe versus over, Wade to be overturned or, or said it was bad law. I don't think any of her 107 opinions that she's written so far as a judge on the Seventh Circuit uh, have touched uh, particularly on the issue of abortion. There was no question that during her confirmation hearing, she was questioned about her Catholic beliefs, I yeah. thought in a very unfair way. Senator Feinstein said, you know, the dogma lives loudly in you. And she made it quite clear uh, that her faith is one thing and is personal. And that does not come into her role as a judge. 
But President Trump has said that he is looking for um, anti-abortion judges to fill these seats. Um, certainly, isn't that part of the criteria that he's evaluating when when looking at who ought to be his nominee? Since he's well, made that, know. since he has made that pledge to his his base. Yeah, I, yeah, he certainly has. He said that he's going to appoint uh, originalists and textualists in the mode of Clarence Thomas, Antonin Scalia, uh, and Samuel Alito. I don't know uh, that uh, whether or not they are having a, a quote-unquote litmus test and asking prospective nominees that question. I certainly hope they are not. Uh, in the past, both Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh and other people who have been appointed to the bench under President Trump have been asked point blank whether they made any promises or guarantees about how they would rule in any case, uh, much less Roe right. versus Wade. And they all said that they did not. Uh, and I would hope and expect that they are telling the truth, because after all, once a judge takes an oath, part of that oath is to you know, not prejudge cases uh, and to you know, consider the law uh, after hearing argument from counsel on both sides of the case. Certainly remember uh, how deftly that was handled during those confirmation processes. Um, Republican lawmakers, to change, uh, to change subjects ever so slightly, are facing criticism for their contradictory statements over how they plan to handle this vacancy on the court compared to how they handled President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland in 2016. Do you think right. that that criticism is fair? And do you agree with how Republicans are proceeding now? Well, different senators made different statements at the time. Clearly, uh, Mitch McConnell said, you know, not only is there an upcoming election, but one of the reasons why we're not going to do this is because we have divided government. You know, we have a president who's a Democrat and the Senate, which is the, the, the body that gives its advice and consent. The House isn't involved in this process, was uh, in Republican hands. And so to some extent, uh, it's a question of history. It may be a question of principle and certainly the ability to do something, raw power, uh, does play uh, into this. Uh, and, you know, the Democrats are going to cry foul. They're already out there uh, doing that. And we'll see whether or not that resonates with the, uh, with the American people. Vacancies do not come along very often. Every single one of them is important. Senator McConnell has vowed uh, that they will take up the nominee, uh, but he, of course, has to keep at least 50 senators, including himself, together before that can get done. Yeah, but John, on that point about divided government, we do have a divided government right now. The House is held by Democrats and the Senate is controlled by Republicans. What makes it different is that Mitch McConnell and President Trump are both Republicans, so they have the power to do so, which is different from a philosophical argument about uh, trying to keep a balance of power or having a, a mandate, right? Well, the Constitution makes quite clear that the House of Representatives is not involved in the confirmation process. Uh, the, the president nominates, right. and it is the Senate that gives it, its advice uh, and consent. Uh, of course, House members are elected every two years. Senators are elected for six years, so they you know, have a longer uh, uh, period of time. Uh, and so, yes, we are divided in that the House is controlled by the Democrats, and the situation may change depending on how the American public reacts to this whole process uh, when we have our elections in November. But at the moment, the two bodies or the, the, the two entities that are involved in this process, the presidency and the Senate, are in control of one party. Yes. But the Constitution also doesn't say that, it, that there's a, a timeline before the election in which a, a nomination by the president ought to be considered or not considered by the Senate. That's but right. this, is, this is a debate that is going to, going to continue, and there are many different uh, interesting machinations of it. John Malcolm, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Good to be with you.